In previous lecture we discussed photoelectric emission. We now recapitulate the experimental features and observations described in previous lecture, known as laws of photoelectric effect. First, for a given photosensitive material, and frequency of incident radiation, above the threshold frequency, the photoelectric current is directly proportional to the intensity of incident light. Second, for a given photosensitive material, and frequency of incident radiation, saturation current is found to be proportional to the intensity of incident radiation, whereas the stopping potential is independent of its intensity. Third, for a given photosensitive material, there exists a certain minimum cutoff frequency of the incident radiation, called the threshold frequency, below which no emission of photoelectrons takes place, no matter how intense the incident light is. Above the threshold frequency, the stopping potential, or equivalently the maximum kinetic energy, of the emitted photoelectrons, increases linearly with the frequency of the incident radiation, but is independent of its intensity. Next, the photoelectric emission is an instantaneous process without any apparent time lag that is 10 to the power minus 9 seconds or less even when the incident radiation is made exceedingly dim. According to the wave picture of light, the free electrons at the surface of the metal, over which the beam of radiation falls, absorb the radiant energy continuously. The greater the intensity of radiation, the greater are the amplitude of electric and magnetic fields. Consequently, the greater the intensity, the greater should be the energy absorbed by each electron. In this picture, the maximum kinetic energy of the photoelectrons on the surface is then expected to increase with increase in intensity. Also, no matter what the frequency of radiation is, a sufficiently intense beam of radiation, over a sufficient time, should be able to impart enough energy to the electrons, so that they exceed the minimum energy needed to escape from the metal surface. A threshold frequency, therefore, should not exist. These expectations of the wave theory directly contradict observations of photoelectric effect. Further, we should note that in the wave picture, the absorption of energy by electron takes place continuously over the entire wavefront of the radiation. Since a large number of electrons absorb energy, the energy absorbed per electron per unit time turns out to be small. Explicit calculations estimate that it can take us or more for a single electron to pick up sufficient energy to overcome the work function and come out of the metal. This conclusion is again in striking contrast to observation, 4, that the photoelectric emission is instantaneous. In short, the wave picture is unable to explain the most basic features of photoelectric emission. Albert Einstein proposed that, radiation energy is built up of discrete units the so-called quanta of energy of radiation. Each quantum of radiant energy has energy h nu, where h is Planck's constant and nu the frequency of light. In photoelectric effect, an electron absorbs a quantum of energy, h nu, of radiation. If this quantum of energy absorbed exceeds the minimum energy needed for the electron to escape from the metal surface, work function phi naught, the electron is emitted with maximum kinetic energy k max, that is equal to h nu minus phi naught. Since k max must be non-negative, Einstein's equation implies that photoelectric emission is possible only if h nu is greater than phi naught. Thus, there exists a threshold frequency nu not for the metal surface, below which no photoelectric emission is possible, no matter how intense the incident radiation may be, or how long it falls on the surface. In other words, frequency of incident radiation should be greater than threshold frequency, where threshold frequency equal to phi not divided by h. In this picture, intensity of radiation as noted above, is proportional to the number of energy quanta per unit area per unit time. The greater the number of energy quanta available, the greater is the number of electrons, absorbing the energy quanta and greater, therefore, is the number of electrons coming out of the metal, for nu greater than nu naught. This explains why, photoelectric current is proportional to intensity. According to Einstein's equation, K max depends linearly on nu, and is independent of intensity of radiation, in agreement with observation. This has happened because in Einstein's picture, photoelectric effect arises from the absorption of a single quantum of radiation by a single electron. The intensity of radiation, that is proportional to, the number of energy quanta per unit area per unit time, is irrelevant to this basic process. In Einstein's picture, the basic elementary process involved in photoelectric effect is the absorption of a light quantum by an electron. This process is instantaneous. Thus, whatever may be the intensity i.e., the number of quanta of radiation per unit area per unit time, photoelectric emission is instantaneous. Low intensity does not mean delay in emission, since the basic elementary process is the same. Intensity only determines how many electrons are able to participate in the elementary process, that is, absorption of a light quantum by a single electron, and, therefore, the photoelectric current.
Millikan performed a series of experiments on photoelectric effect, aimed at disproving Einstein's photoelectric equation. He measured the slope of the straight line obtained for sodium. Using the known value of E, he determined the value of Planck's constant, H. This value was close to the value of Planck's constant 6.626 multiplied by 10 to the power minus 34 joule second, determined in an entirely different context. In this way, in 1916, Millikan proved the validity of Einstein's photoelectric equation, instead of disproving it. The successful explanation of photoelectric effect using the hypothesis of light quanta and the experimental determination of values of Planck's constant and work function, in agreement with values obtained from other experiments, led to the acceptance of Einstein's picture of photoelectric effect. Millikan verified photoelectric equation, with great precision, for a number of alkali metals, over a wide range of radiation frequencies. It was Sir Isaac Newton who had initially proposed the corpuscular theory of light. His theory was abandoned in favor of the wave theory, proposed by Huygens, as the latter was in agreement with experiments like interference and diffraction. More than a century later, Planck's quantum theory, somewhat similar to Newton's corpuscular theory, got support from Einstein in the explanation of the photoelectric effect according to Planck's quantum theory, light consists of packets of energy, referred to as photons hereafter, which have the following properties, a photon of light of frequency nu contains energy E which is directly proportional to the frequency, hence, E equals to H nu, where H is Planck's constant photons also carry momentum, P equal to E by C that is equal to H nu by C equals to H by lambda where E is the energy of the photon, C is the velocity of light in vacuum and lambda is wavelength of radiation. A photon is massless, that is zero rest mass, and moves with the velocity of light in vacuum. It can never be brought to rest. Also photon is electrically neutral. A photocell is a technological application of the photoelectric effect. It is a device whose electrical properties are affected by light. It is also sometimes called an electric eye. A photocell converts a change in intensity of illumination into a change in photocurrent. This current can be used to operate control systems and in light measuring devices. A photocell of lead sulfide sensitive to infrared radiation is used in electronic ignition circuits. In scientific work, photocells are used whenever it is necessary to measure the intensity of light. Light meters in photographic cameras make use of photocells to measure the intensity of incident light. The photocells, inserted in the door light electric circuit, are used as automatic door opener. A person approaching a doorway may interrupt a light beam which is incident on a photocell. The abrupt change in photocurrent may be used to start a motor which opens the door or rings an alarm. They are used in the control of a counting device which records every interruption of the light beam caused by a person or object passing across the beam. So photocells help count the persons entering an auditorium, provided they enter the hall one by one. They are used for detection of traffic law defaulters, an alarm may be sounded whenever a beam of, invisible, radiation is intercepted. In burglar alarm, invisible, ultraviolet light is continuously made to fall on a photocell installed at the doorway. A person entering the door interrupts the beam falling on the photocell. The abrupt change in photocurrent is used to start an electric bell ringing. In fire alarm, a number of photocells are installed at suitable places in a building. In the event of breaking out of fire, light radiations fall upon the photocell. This completes the electric circuit through an electric bell or a siren which starts operating as a warning signal. Photocells are used in the reproduction of sound in motion pictures and in the television camera for scanning and telecasting scenes. They are used in industries for detecting minor flaws or holes in metal sheets. The wave nature of light shows up in the phenomena of interference, diffraction and polarization. On the other hand, in photoelectric effect and Compton effect which involve energy and momentum transfer, radiation behaves as if it is made up of a bunch of particles, the photons. Whether a particle or wave description is best suited for understanding an experiment depends on the nature of the experiment. A natural question arises, if radiation has a dual, wave particle, nature, might not the particles of nature, the electrons, protons, etc., also exhibit wave-like character? French physicist Louis Victor de Broglie, pronounced as de Broglie, put forward the bold hypothesis that moving particles of matter should display wave-like properties under suitable conditions. He reasoned that nature was symmetrical and that the two basic physical entities matter and energy must have symmetrical character. If radiation shows dual aspects, so should matter. De Broglie proposed that the wavelength associated with the particle of momentum, P is given by H by P equal to H by mv where m is the mass of the particle and v its speed. This equation is known as the de Broglie relation and the wavelength of the matter wave is called de Broglie wavelength. 
The dual aspect of matter is evident in the de Broglie relation. On the left hand side of lambda that is wavelength, is the attribute of a wave while on the right hand side the momentum, P is a typical attribute of a particle. Planck's constant H relates the two attributes. De Broglie equation for a material particle is basically a hypothesis whose validity can be tested only by experiment. However, it is interesting to see that it is satisfied also by a photon. While the Heisenberg uncertainty principle does not mean, there are some things you can never be sure of, it does imply, you can never be sure of everything. How can this be? If you can never be sure of everything, doesn't that mean there are some things you can never be sure of? Surprisingly, no. In science we are ultimately concerned with what we observe. So, when we say we are uncertain about something, we mean that we are uncertain about what we will observe when we do an experiment. The simplest example of the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is the following, you can never be certain of both the position and the speed of a microscopic particle. It is possible to arrange an experiment so you can predict the position of a particle. A different experiment would let you predict its speed. But you will never be able to arrange things so that you can be certain of both its position and its speed. You might be jumping up and down at this point and saying, that's ridiculous. If I want to know both I just measure them simultaneously. Or I first measure the position, then the speed. In fact, neither of these options will work, and what rules them out is other forms of the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle itself. In the first case, there is the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle that says it is not possible to simultaneously measure position and speed with perfect accuracy. In the second, there is the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle that says if you accurately measure the position you will disturb its speed, making it more uncertain, and vice versa. So you can't get around it. Heisenberg's principle is not like that it's actually a consequence of something more fundamental. That thing is quantum mechanics, a theory that applies to all forms of matter and energy, as far as we can tell. Unfortunately, although quantum mechanics seems fundamental, it's not simple, and so cannot be encapsulated as a principle. But from it follow all forms of the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. You may have heard the anecdote about a woman who is stopped by a policeman who says, I just measured your speed as 53.9 km per hour when you were in a 40 km per hour school zone. She retorts, are you familiar with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle? If you are so sure about my speed, you can't possibly know where my car was. It's a cute joke, but let's see what the principle actually says. When the policeman says the speed was measured as 53.9 km per hour, he presumably just means, it was closer to 53.9 than to 53.8 or 54.0. This means an uncertainty of about 0.05 km per hour, which is about 0.01 meters per second. If the mass of the car is 1000 kg then the principle implies, minimum uncertainty in the position of the car is 10 raised to the power minus 36 meter. It is much smaller than the size of an atom. So this is obviously irrelevant when it comes to the question of whether the car was in the school zone or not. The wave nature of electrons was first experimentally verified by Clinton Joseph Davison and Lester Germer in 1927 and independently by G.P. Thompson in 1928. Davison and Thompson shared the Nobel Prize in 1937 for their experimental discovery of diffraction of electrons by crystals. The experimental arrangement used by Davison and Germer consists of an electron gun which comprises of a tungsten filament coated with barium oxide and heated by a low voltage power supply. Electrons emitted by the filament are accelerated to a desired velocity by applying suitable potential voltage from a high voltage power supply. They are made to pass through a cylinder with fine holes along its axis, producing a fine collimated beam. The beam is made to fall on the surface of a nickel crystal. The electrons are scattered in all directions by the atoms of the crystal. The intensity of the electron beam, scattered in a given direction, is measured by the electron detector, collector. The detector can be moved on a circular scale and is connected to a sensitive galvanometer, which records the current. The deflection of the galvanometer is proportional to the intensity of the electron beam entering the collector. The apparatus is enclosed in an evacuated chamber. By moving the detector on the circular scale at different positions, the intensity of the scattered electron beam is measured for different values of angle of scattering Q which is the angle between the incident and the scattered electron beams. The variation of the intensity of the scattered electrons with the angle of scattering is obtained for different accelerating voltages. The experiment was performed by varying the accelerating voltage from 44 volt to 68 volt. It was noticed that a strong peak appeared in the intensity of the scattered electron for an accelerating voltage of 54 volt at a scattering angle of 50 degree. 
The appearance of the peak in a particular direction is due to the constructive interference of electrons scattered from different layers of the regularly spaced atoms of the crystals. From the electron diffraction measurements, the wavelength of matter waves was found to be 0.165 nanometer of 1.65 angstrom. The de Broglie wavelength associated with electrons, using de Broglie equation, at 54 volt is given by 0.167 nanometer of 1.67 angstrom. Thus, there is an excellent agreement between the theoretical value and the experimentally obtained value of de Broglie wavelength. The vision germa experiment thus strikingly confirms the wave nature of electrons and the de Broglie relation. In 1989, the wave nature of a beam of electrons was experimentally demonstrated in a double slit experiment, similar to that used for the wave nature of light. Also, in an experiment in 1994, interference fringes were obtained with the beams of iodine molecules, which are about a million times more massive than electrons. The de Broglie hypothesis has been basic to the development of modern quantum mechanics. It has also led to the field of electron optics. The wave properties of electrons have been utilized in the design of electron microscope, which is a great improvement, with higher resolution, over the optical microscope.